Hello students, welcome to study IQ. In this session, we are going to continue with our history discussion. The period that I am going to discuss is actually from 1813 to 1823. So we have already discussed up to 1813. So I don't think that you will have any doubt with respect to that discussion. If you see, even the history also we are discussing in a mathematical way. We have made the flowchart and we are discussing in that order so that you will not forget. And that flowchart or that algorithm is already printed in your mind, right? So we started off with uh, 1757. Battle of Plassey, then we went on to 1773 Regulating Act and the two important provisions that we have discussed under Regulating Act was it was basically to regulate the East India Company okay so who's going to regulate whom it is a British Parliament is going to regulate the company in India so through Regulating Act the Governor General post was created right so till then it was governor of bengal now the governor of bengal became governor general of bengal along with four members so we have talked about governor general of bengal plus four members and i have told you the first governor general of bengal was warren hasting the governor general will be appointed by the company because he is the head of the company and the four members were appointed by the parliament and through them only the main regulation is there because decisions are taken on the basis of majority so if this four member uh, standing against Warren Hastings, he could not implement any any decisions, right? And these four members were appointed by the Parliament or the Crown. And who are the members? Richard Barwell, Philip Francis, George Monson, and John Clavering. And I've told you since these are the first four council members, you need to remember the name. Apart from that, there are many other people who are going to come, and that's not that significant. Okay, whatever is significant, I'll tell you that you need to remember. So after that. Uh, we have discussed about the second point that is related to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has to be established and the Supreme Court was established in 1774. The act was in 73. The court was established in 74 at Calcutta. And I've told you this was only for Europeans because European law and Indian laws are different. You should not confuse it with the present day modern Supreme Court that is uh, trace its origin from 1935 government of India Act that we will discuss when it comes to 1935. So this Supreme Court is only for the trial of Europeans. Okay. And the the first chief justice of the supreme court was justice elijah impey and then we have discussed about why his period in history is known as trial and error period and we have tried to answer that we have discussed about indology we have discussed about the problem of land revenue collection we have discussed a problem with legal systems and we have discussed about indology as a solution to all these we have talked about uh, you know jindu court which was uh, uh, you know uh, which was a translation of manusmriti Okay, so that was in uh, 17, 1786. No, that was in 1776. And when we discussed about Calcutta Madrasa, we have discussed in 1780 Calcutta Madrasa. And then we have talked about Asiatic Society of Bengal, that was in 1784. So all those things we have done and we have also talked about the revenue settlement uh, which was tried by Lord Warren Hastings and the problems also the five year settlement also we discussed the one year settlement also we discussed okay and then we discussed one of the most important governor general Lord Cornwallis so that is the period between 1786 to 1793 when you see Lord Warren Hastings it is from 1773 to 1785 then comes Lord Cornwallis and Lord Cornwallis was the person who was leading the battle from English side in the American War of Independence against America and the, the good thing is that the person who was a failure over there when it comes to India he have a huge success story to write and we are studying a lot of reforms of Lord Cornwallis in fact civil services was introduced by Lord Cornwallis so we talked about civil service reform we talked about police reform we talked about judicial reform the Cornwallis court so when we talked about civil service reform he is known as a father of civil service but that was not through open competitive exam that was not for Indians okay only English and uh, not through any open competitive exam but he introduced civil services police reform I've told you till then uh, the zamindars were enjoying the power of policing but now police officials were appointed formally police stations were established and all those concepts we have discussed and then we talked about judicial reform or the Cornwallis court and we have understood that uh, the changes in the structure of courts okay the uh, structure as well as changes in laws also and we have discussed that four diwani courts were established at dhaka patna calcutta murshidabad so almost all the important facts have covered over there and i've told you two new concepts that was introduced by lord cornwallis which even as the basic pillar of the constitution what was that that is rule of law and equality before law so lord cornwallis introduced two concepts in Indian legal system, rule of law, equality before law. 
concept of equality before law now there is equality but at this when we talk about this equality it is between indian and indian between indian and european there is no such equality okay so at least among indians equality was introduced then rule of law that means everybody have to work within the law even the governor general also have to work within the law and then we have talked about uh, permanent settlement which was introduced by lord cornwallis as a solution to the that faced with respect to land re land revenue settlement and i've told you here you are not allowing the zamindars to fix the amount that they are going to collect that was actually the root cause of the problems in uh, during warren hastings uh, experiments right so here the state fixed the amount on the basis of a base year that is 1790 so the tax is actually fixed on the basis of 1790 and the same will be paid later also so that we have covered and we have discussed that this was in the eastern part of india like bengal bihar orissa and parts of tamil nadu parts of banaras and around 19 percentage of the british india is actually covered by the permanent settlement or this uh, this zamindari settlement so zamindars will collect the tax from the peasants and will pay to the state zamindars were considered as the owners of the land but this ownership is not absolute between zamindar and peasant zamindar is the owner between zamindar and the state state is the owner so just like the peasant could be evicted by the zamindars at any point of time if the peasant is not paying the tax similarly the zamindar could also be changed by the state if the if the zamindar is not able to realize the tax or pay the tax before the sunset of the set period under which law sunset law which was introduced in 1794 so sunset law for all those things we have covered who introduced lord con john shore and john shore i've told you is going to be the next governor general okay so that's about permanent settlement and along with that we have also talked about riotvari settlement uh, which was introduced by thomas munro and reed which was introduced in different phases like in 1805 then 1817 uh, 1818 so year is not important who introduced is important thomas munro and reed in fact it was asked in 2017 prelims directly just like that where it is introduced southern part and central part so tamil nadu and almost entire tamil nadu uh, means madras so madras means it covers entire tamil nadu parts of kerala parts of uh, you know andhra pradesh parts of karnataka so it's such a huge territory and then bombay that means it include gujarat maharashtra Sindh. okay that area that is again big central provinces with capital nagpur so you can see rottweiler system is actually in the maximum area that's that covers around 51 percentage of the british india so uh, so where it, in, it is introduced the southern and central part what percentage of the area 51 percentage of the area here the peasant directly came into contact with state so peasant and state directly between them there is no intermediary like zamindar but who will collect there will be a british official to collect the tax from the peasant so the ownership is given to the peasants discussed about various problems in zamindari settlement or the permanent settlement and here also the common problems include you know uh, the high rate of taxation and then money lenders very high rate of interest uh, indebtedness rural indebtedness okay and that lead to uh, unemployment rural landless labors poverty exploitation all these problems we have discussed apart from that in zamindari settlement we have talked two important or specific uh, impact that is absentee landlordism and chain of intermediaries okay and then we have discussed about Halwari settlement which was in the northern part so eastern part is covered by permanent settlement south and central is covered by the Rotwari settlement and Mahalwari settlement is in the northern part like in Punjab again which comprises huge areas present day Pakistan, Slahor, Punjab, Haryana that entire region is coming western part of UP so that comes around 30 percentage of British India so these three settlements cover the British India now when permanent set the when the Rotwari settlement was established permanent settlement is not over no that is not the case all are going simultaneously in different parts of the country okay so that's about the settlement that we have discussed and then we talked about lord wellesley in fact we we skip the person john shore there is nothing much to discuss from exam point of view so we skip that we are only focusing on exam point of view we are not discussing anything else no other intentions okay so wellesley we have talked mainly about uh, uh, subsidiary alliance which is very controversial policy so i told you if the question is about who's the pioneer or who introduced subsidiary alliance it is actually a french governor duplex who introduced this policy when he rendered his army to hyderabad in 1740s so who's the pioneer it is duplex but wellesley made certain changes and he used very beautifully this policy to keep his army across country that too without spending anything from their exchequer so 
he made certain changes and he forcefully made uh, you know agreements with many kingdoms or many ki local kings and some kings voluntarily also sign if they are facing the threat so subsidiary alliance is actually a military help but wellesley used it in a much more practical way pragmatic way not pragmatic beautiful way in their interest from from the british side to suit their interest that they don't want to spend anything to maintain an army but they can maintain an army across india okay and there were some conditions like if a local ruler is signing the treaty you cannot employ any foreigner other than english in your army firstly secondly if you are signing this treaty in case of any war policy any or any war treaty or peace treaty you have to inform it firstly to the british in case if you are signing between two other you know kings so it's almost like surrendering the sovereignty inform was the word which is very diplomatically used effectively you need to get the permission from the british so you are surrendering the sovereignty and that's the reason why tipu was not interested in signing the treaty so mysore did not sign the treaty and instead tipu went for a battle and in 1799 in that fourth anglo mysore war tipu actually died and after the death of tipu mysore signed the treaty so there is a very famous statement uh, and you can expect that in uh, exam also in mains directly giving the statement his uh, tipu's death in history is understood as an honorable death than a dishonorable pact discuss so what is that dishonorable pact is talking about here it is subsidiary alliance nothing else you don't want to write about all the other three wars the strategies i have seen people you know writing I, i was just evaluating the papers of some students history papers last week i i i, I was actually evaluating the history papers around uh, 200 papers i was evaluating so in that all people are writing about all the three wars all the causes how the strategies and all these things people are talking about but nobody rarely you know one percentage i can see people are talking about subsidiary alliance the question is about subsidiary alliance what is that pact dishonorable pact the pact is all about subsidiary alliance okay and then the third one is an english resident had to be stationed in the capital of that local state who was signing the treaty and the entire expenditure of that local resident had to be taken care by the local king including the guards soldiers food clothing etc so these are the three conditions in return the britishers promised that they will not interfere in the internal matters of that state which they never did or hardly did okay they always interfere then they also promised that they will protect the local king or the this particular state from any external threat in fact they became the threat later and i've told you already that since this state which signed the subsidiary alliance in 1803 but exactly after 40 years Sindh was annexed under British territory, and I've told you the person who was responsible for the annexation of Sindh, Mr. Charles Napier. He wrote a letter to the Governor General at that time, Lord Ellenborough, by saying that we don't have any right to annex Sindh, and still we do it. What a piece of rascality it will be, right? That itself shows how they they don't have any. Actually, they don't have any right to annex Sindh because you have to protect Sindh as Sindh is a state which signed the subsidiary subsidiary alliance in 1803. One more case also there. Avad signed the subsidiary alliance, but Avad was annexed under misgovernance in 1856, and that was one of the most important reasons for 1857 revolt. Because you can see most of the army members are from Avad; they were not able to digest that. Okay, and the moment Avad was annexed, Avad came under permanent settlement, so you need to pay more tax also. So these people, army members whose fathers are actually in uh, the peasants, the farmers only, so they need to pay high tax now. And in fact, these people are uh, these army members are called or known as farmers in uniform. So now their economic interest also hurt. So that is also one of the very important reason for 1857 revolt. We will come to that. So I am connecting all those things. Okay. So that's about subsidiary lands, and then we have talked about Fort William College was established at Calcutta in 1800, and then we talked about Lord uh, Minto I. And the most important point that we discussed is actually Treaty of Amritsar. Apart from that, we have also talked about Charter Act of 1813. And two points I have told you that the monopoly of East India Company ended, except in two items that is trade in tea product and trade with China. And I have told you. when we discussed about 18 discuss about 1833 charter act the surviving two monopoly will also be over okay so here two monopolies are there trade in tea and trade with china except that every monopoly ended so except in trade in tea products and trade with china their monopoly ended and i've told you that leads to a deindustrialization in india because more and more companies started coming to india they started dumping the finished products in india so the life of artisans are totally ruined because their products are not at all competitive with the products which is coming which is finished products which are very cheap which is uh, produced by using machines but here uh, it became you know the artisans product became not competitive in the market so they lost the job and that led to 
disguised unemployment because all these people have to depend on agriculture and all those things we have discussed and i told you that affected the industrialization in india and that led to deindustrialization in india so when we talk about anything related to industry disguised unemployment deindustrialization etc you have to bring in 1813 charter act because it played a most important role it is actually the root cause for deindustrialization in india till then uh, we had a balance between agriculture and industry but that balance has been broken with this okay and then we have talked about uh, uh, one more provision was related to education that the company was directed to spend rupees 1 lakh for the purpose of betterment of education in those areas where they have control right so you now the company is going to spend uh, something for education and i have told you this is a first step towards education so after this some more thing is going to happen some more steps are going to happen radical steps are going to happen 1835 you can see maculum minute which is based on trickle down theory or downward filtration theory we will discuss that and then in 1837 persian was replaced with english as the official language 1854 woods despatch which is known as magna carta of modern indian education 1882 hunder commission all these are you know milestones in education if you get any question related to education without mentioning about these milestones your answer is not complete especially if you are getting essay related questions okay so now in this session we can direct so we have reached till 1830 now so this is how you need to connect so in this 10 15 minutes i was able to explain you know in a very simple language 181757 to 1813 so this is the this is the you know 1757 to 1813 we have done within this 15 15 or 10 minutes right so this is a you know kind of understanding that you need to have with respect to history so that's what i told you you can learn history in a mathematical way you will not forget it see if you missed out any of my videos not only in economy whether it is in uh, you know uh, history or ethics or quantitative aptitude or even sociology you can get in touch with me here that's my instagram id okay zia safir that's my instagram id and this is my telegram channel also same id and you can get in touch with me in facebook also the same id okay or zia ias that's my facebook page so in any of this you can get in touch with me or if you wish to attend my answer writing program sessions and the test series in gs as well as sociology uh, you can write to me or you can uh, call me this is my number 9790892697 or 9895777 Double seven five. So any help related to civil service exam, if you have, if you need, you can contact me. Okay. So let's uh, discuss about this period now. Eighteen thirteen to nineteen thirteen. This period is what we need to discuss now. So who is the governor general during this time? It is Lord Hastings. Lord Hastings. Okay. So eighteen thirteen to eighteen. Sorry, eighteen thirteen to. 1823 not 1913 sorry by mistake i have written that 1813 to 1913 see 18 uh, during this time uh, 1805 1807 to 1813 i have told you minto minto one one more minto is going to come exactly after 100 years and you can see in 1909 almost during this period morley minto reforms right so that's how history repeats 1757 battle of plassey 1857 uh, revolt okay and then 1947 freedom so uh, all these are repetitions so under hastings the first point is actually anglo nepal war anglo nepal war 1816 so that was actually ended with the treaty of sagauli sagauli and lord hastings was honored as marquis okay so he was honored as marquis so i have told you already the wars as a separate topic it that in itself requires separate discussion i'll talk about anglo punjab war anglo mysore war anglo maratha war anglo afghan war all these wars we will be doing a separate discussion like what we have done in case of socio religious reform movements we'll do that separately so i'm not getting into the details of this war so just understand this uh, treaty of sagauli was related to anglo nepal war and uh, you know this treaty uh, the uh, this treaty was signed and he was honored as marcus then the third anglo maratha war third anglo maratha war so this war between this war was uh, between uh, 1817 to 18 okay so this third anglo maratha war here also i don't want to discuss too much about the war but what i want to tell you is uh, 
uh, what I want to tell you with this is actually their strategy is going to change. That's what I want to tell you. So this is very important from you know main's point of view. Till then they were actually happy with whatever area they had, right? But in 1813 Charter Act, this is also one of the impact of 1813 Charter Act. Why they are fighting these wars, etc. You can see this is exactly because of the impact of 1813 Charter Act. One impact that we have discussed is related to deindustrialization. Now here they started, you know, expanding their area because new companies are coming. They are in need of two uh, two cases, right? First of all, they need markets to sell their product, and they need to get the raw material. Okay, so for the market and for the raw material, you need to have a political control in all the areas. So they try to expand their territory in India. Till then, till 1813, they were very much happy with whatever areas they had. And you know, subsidiary alliance, when I've discussed, I've told you it is not for expansion of territory, it is to maintain their army. But now that concept is going to be used for expansion of territory. And you can see doctrine of labs, etc. All are coming, all these for expanding their territory. So at this point, during Hastings time, there is a change in policy, there is a shift in policy. What is a shift in policy? They started annexing or they started expanding their territory. So the shift in policy, you can see that is the most important point that I need to discuss from Hastings. Apart from that prelims point of view, there is nothing. Apart from this war, there can be a question because uh, in this war that concept of Peshwa was abolished okay the post of Peshwa was abolished and uh, the Peshwa at that time that is Baji Rao too he was deported to Vitur so institution of Peshwa abolished and Baji Rao too who was the last Peshwa okay uh, it was actually he was uh, sent to Vitur and it is a common practice that the Britishers do after beating a king he, the Britishers will not allow a king to stay back you know once you beat that king the reason is see the subcontinent people are so much emotionally connected to the rulers ex rulers etc so if he is allowed to stay back he will be able to mobilize the masses with extreme energy and he can fight back so he was and you can see that when Bahadur Shah Zafar was beaten in 1857 revolt he was sent to uh, some other place right so that Rangoon he was sent to so you can see that when uh, Dilip Singh the minor son of uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh when he was beaten he was sent to England so like this you can see a lot of examples that if the king was beaten in a war he will not be allowed to stay in that particular area because he see this is the reason uh, the subcontinent people are emotionally very much attached to the ruler i've told you when we discussed about annexation of Awadh, the nawab at that time wajid ali shah people were so much connected to nawab okay so what is accused accused of misgovernance but it was not the case Lucknow, Lucknowi culture is very famous and nawab Awadh was one of the very prosperous state so people have emotional attachment so that is the reason why they're sending the ruler to some other place to uproot them completely from the local people and you can see the uh, you can see this countries like india sri lanka pakistan bangladesh nepal etc it is all based on you know uh, feudal uh, political you know uh, democracy you can see right so it is all connected to you know previous uh, generations you know people can use that okay so and people can get elected if a person is dying if he's in power if he's a minister or something then uh, he, his son or daughter will contest the election and he automatically will get elected elected because people have that emotional attachment with the ruler ex-rulers feudal dynastic democracy these countries okay it is democracy democratically elected and everything is there but it is a kind of you know uh, this system and that is understood by the british so that's the reason why they are not allowing these people to stay back over there so what my point is they started fighting a lot of wars they started capturing the area for two reasons they are in need of market okay to sell their products and they are in need of raw materials to take back to take to england okay so they take the raw material they will dump the finished product so for that they need political control so they started expanding their territory so hastings time is important for change or shift in policy this can be your main question and why this shift in policy because of 1813 charter act so if a question is asked on 1813 charter act what all things you need to write not just the two points that i've discussed you need to talk about the industrialization how it led to deindustrialization you also need to talk about this particular point that i'm talking about because british started expanding their territory as an impact of 1813 charter act because they need more and more area they need political control in more and more area to dump their product they need a market and to get the raw materials also they need political control okay so i hope you understood so what you need to basically understand here during this time was the 
shift in their policy okay and pune was annexed into bombay presidency pune was annexed into bombay presidency see uh, you know when we discuss about 1857 revolt we will talk about nana sahib and in fact we have discussed that nana sahib is fighting the battle from where nana sahib is fighting from kanpur but you know nana sahib is actually the adopted son of baji rao too then why he is fighting from kanpur because he got how he got kanpur address despite he is become he was a maratha because his father baji rao too was uprooted and he was sent to vitur so he was living over there and he is fighting the battle from there okay so here the this wars in detail i'll discuss so you don't worry about the wars i'll take up this discussion separately okay and the uh, main reason that i have discussed about this governor general is basically to explain this point that there was a shift in policy and that this time only you can see that shift in policy okay they started capturing annexing more and more areas and that will be taken care again by the next governor generals and it will reach at its peak when it comes to dalhousie when he introduced the policy doctrine of lapse and he captured many areas and that lead to 1857 revolt so can i say 1813 charter act have a great role to play in 1857 revolt see all those development happened between 1757 to 1857 have role but 1813 charter act have a greater role to play when it come to 1857 revolt because why this annexation still then there was no concept of annexations so the political reason of 1857 revolt was what it is all about annexations jansi is fighting for what so she need her area if that is allowed then nobody will fight right nana sahib all these people are actually bahadur shah zafar all these people are fighting for their own interest okay we will come to that different people are fighting for different interests there was nothing common in them right only commonality is that they are facing a common enemy apart from that there was no commonality and what would have happened if they won the revolt is a hypothetical question it was actually good that 1857 revolt went like that otherwise all those railways which were started might have been closed at that time because people don't want to interact this local kings they want to maintain their autonomy their authority so they don't want any connectivity or anything okay so that is a different part of discussion i am not getting into that that is controversial also we'll discuss when it comes to 1857 revolt so if you wish to attend my regular classes or live classes you can get in touch with me here that's my instagram id we complete everything all the subjects will complete including ethics so i hope you understood the session if you have any doubt in history or economy or any subjects you can feel free to call me i've already given you my contact number and this is my instagram id okay so see you guys thank you